If that's the TMNT theme song you grew up with, you're probably a 2000s kid like me. If so, you've probably enjoyed watching the 2003 Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle series, which aired on 4Kids and Mirage Studios. With over 6 years of trivia spanning 7 seasons, 156 episodes, dozens of recurring characters, a bunch of video games, a movie, and some of the highest quality writing to ever come out of the franchise, TMNT 2003 was undoubtedly the darkest and most brutal reincarnation of the animated turtles. And for many, it was the best told story of our heroes in a half shell. But as time went on and it picked up more traction towards the late 2000s, the quality went down significantly until it was eventually cancelled in 2009. That's why today I'm here to explain the rise and the downfall of TMNT 2003. Ladies and Jellyfish, Shalom, and welcome back to the Downfall of Cartoons, where we take a look at a cartoon that was once awesome, but slowly went downhill until its literal or figurative demise. Today we take a look at TMNT 2003, the turtle show that ran throughout the 2000s and garnered the attention of most people under the age of 25 living today. I mean, go up to any college graduate and ask them to hum the TMNT theme song, and 90% of them will hum you the awesome 1, 2, 3, 4 opening of this 4 kids jam. Created by Lloyd Goldfine and based on the comics of the legendary duo Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, this show aired on the 4 Kids Network, which was a block on Fox, which was famous for poorly dubbing and censoring Japanese anime, and some Western media for a younger audience. However, this show did not pander to children at all and instantly became known as the darkest iteration of the Turtles to date, and was recognizable for its deeper and more mature writing, more defined and bulky art style, less comedic focused action fight scenes, and a dark gritty tone that made everything look cool and badass. It was pretty hard not to get hooked on this show, which delved into themes of magic, fantasy, time travel, space, and a lot of references to Japanese culture and history. It aired for 7 long seasons spanning 156 episodes, but a lot of fans began to notice plot holes and drastic changes as the show got towards the last few seasons, and many fans jumped ship after season 5, where the show began the whole Ninja Tribunal saga, which many fans still regarded as great quality, but got a bit gimmicky by the dependent of others. And many more jumped ship after the drastic drop in quality when the Turtles travel 100 years in the future for the 6th season, titled Fast Forward. And when they come back and we get a bunch of other weird changes to the turtles with the seventh and final season. But enough introduction, we'll get into all those when the time comes for it. But right now, let's dive deep into the shell of this crap season by season as we completely understand the hit that was the 2003 rendition of. <laughs> We start the show pretty damn strong. I haven't really seen the first few episodes in years because it's all mostly exposition on reading April and introducing the monsters and all that, but overall it's all pretty well executed in terms of introducing us to this world, and this new darker tone compared to the 80s show. The first few episodes also have some incredibly impressive animation shots compared to the rest of the show. Maybe they had a slightly bigger budget for the pilot, or they just wanted it to stand out at the start, but some dark shots of them training with just their bright saturated mask colors showing in the darkness look really epic. It seems a bit of a minor thing to comment on, but if you watch the the first few episodes, you'll get what I mean. It's really noticeable. We start the first 10 episodes introducing most of our secondary characters, while building on and giving some background as to what each turtle's philosophy is and how this world operates. We meet Stockman, Casey, April, Angel, Orokusaki, even the freaking Garbage Man. Each one gets their own episode to shine, and we see similarities between them and the main cast, like in the case of Raph and Casey. Then we get the Shredder episodes, a two-parter by the name of Shredder Strikes, and another titled Shredder Strikes Back. I see what you did there. Both are amazing and are some of the first episodes I watched as a kid, we immediately see that this Shredder is the absolute best Shredder that will ever exist in this entire franchise, and we get tons of action with the Turtles fighting him and the Foot Clan ninjas. We see him walk through fire, looking absolutely menacing, probably the most menacing he'll be in the entire series. I guess the level of mystery behind him as of the first season also adds a level of menace to him that slowly fades over time. Also that fight scene with Splinter has to be one of the coolest Splinter scenes of the entire show. That whole water tower thing was just awesome. But after Shredder strikes again, the Turtles don't get so lucky. They nearly get blown up after an ambush at April's shop and have to escape to Casey's old farmhouse with Leo in a coma state. Before I move on to the next arc, we get a really cool transition episode where each brother gives childhood stories to try and wake up Leo. It's like Johnny's 100th episode, just not garbage. We get really cool insight as to why the team is the way it is, and we see childhood flashbacks to the turtles. Raph also has a lot of development, even crying at one point. It's all super deep stuff, and is one of my all-time favorite episodes. The turtles finally return to New York City and hijack Shredder's lair, taking out their stronghold 
Goblin trying to finally get their revenge on Shredder for nearly murdering them all. The entire arc is fascinating to watch and has some awesome action scenes. If not for this line though, it would have never been this incredible. The only difference between men and boys is the size of their toys. The Sword of Tengu is also prominently used, especially when Leo uses it to decapitate Shredder at the end of the episode. Unfortunately, Splinter goes missing during the whole debacle, and now their mission is to search for him. Another transition episode, Lone Raph and Cub, is another example of how incredibly this show handled its filler episodes. This episode focuses on Raph this time, rather than Leo, and gives us tons of character development as it relates to Raphael, pairing him up with a small kid who's trying to save his mom, and the goofy and heartwarming shenanigans they go through. Again, one of my all-time favorites. Then we get back to the Search for Master Splinter 2-parter, which kickstarts their next mission, which is to find Master Splinter among the massive rat maze, pun intended, that is New York City. They immediately get all indicators pointing to the TCRI building, which is the same ooze that turned them into mutants. And so, hilarity and action ensue as they infiltrate the Utron secret HQ, and discover the Brain Blob's lair. But before they can save Master Splinter, when they find him in one of their laboratories, they accidentally get zapped away into their world. Wait, does this mean we can go to season 2? Season 2 is where the show really found its calling, and got its footing in the right place. Here, they were finally established as a TMNT show with good writing, solid characterization, and a dark brooding tone, and we've been introduced to Utroms, to Shredder, to Stockman, to pretty much all the big boys. Now it's time to go to space. After the turtles were vaporized on the time machine, or should I say teleporter, they get zapped to another world far off in space, and meet Honeycut, or the Fugitoid. Yup, this 5 episode series is about the turtles in space, and we get introduced to the Federation and the Triceratons, and all the conflicts between those two races. The prison scenes are my personal favorites, and the entire story is basically a TV movie in terms of length, so I totally recommend it. The weirdest thing for me though is that whole internal breathing thing. It was pretty damn cool. Our ninja training teaches us how to slow our breath and heart rate, enabling us to survive the loss of atmosphere. Like... How? Then they come back to Earth, discovering that the Utroms were actually a peaceful and allying race, and that they were healing Master Splinter back to good health. They meet Mortu, the head of the Utroms, who takes them on a time-traveling tour of sorts to show them the cool history of the Utrom race, and how they got stranded on Earth and came to live amongst humans. Here they also meet Shirel, who is the Shredder! And after a newly spider-eyed Stockman hijacks the technology, the Shredder cut off the poor guy's limbs, the gang gets trapped in time and now have to fight off Japanese ninjas and fight Shirel. Then they blow up Shirel. It's all pretty cool stuff. I think this show handled the Utrum shtick pretty well, and this backstory was very well needed in my opinion. Also, I mean, who doesn't freaking love more to? Then we meet Karai in the next arc of City at War. This is another great special because it has a lot of moving pieces that all just make sense. After Shredder has finally been taken out, or so we think, foolish as we are, New York City breaks out into a gang war for regional and territorial power between the Purple Dragons, the Foot, and the Mob. And all this is happening basically because the Turtles took out Shredder, thinking that it was the right thing to do. So Leo feels personally responsible for all the crime and all the atrocities, while Raph couldn't care less, telling Leo it's not their fight. As a TMNT fan, as much as everyone complains about the cliché of these two butting heads all the time, I absolutely adore it. As a Raph guy, I connect a lot more to him in the start, when Leo's plan almost gets them killed. But after he abandons the guys after they team up with Karai, you see where he goes wrong and you can see Leo's side a lot more clearly. Their character clash is perfectly shown here and makes the team a lot more meaningful when they come back together. Then Shredder comes back and tries to kill the Turtles. A Triceratops sacrifices himself and kills Shredder again. Bro, will Shredder just stay dead? He literally can't. Not at the water tower after he got his head cut off after he exploded the Utrum ship. And even here, the little bastard gets away from the fire. He's even better than Stockman at cheating death. And finishing the season off pretty strong, we get a lot more backstory in Splinter's life, as we learn that he used to be a famous warrior in the Battle Nexus tournament, which the Turtles also participate in after they follow him in a portal. Here, we meet some new characters like Usagi, revisit some old ones like Damio and the Ultimate Ninja, and get some pretty cool action scenes between different pairs of characters. Let's be real, this is just like how we used to do the tournament fights with our toys when we were kids. No one? Just me? Whatever. My favorite fight has to be between Mikey and Raph, but honestly, all of the Mikey fights were hilarious. Hey, Fuzzy! What say we call this a draw? And I'll spring for the other half of that haircut! Overall, it's pretty cool, and the fact that Mikey wins the entire competition is pretty hilarious. Let's see if Season 3 gets any better. Season 3 is where things really take off, as we start the season with a six-part, let's be real, movie of sorts, about the Triceratons invading Earth to search for the Fugitoid. Now look, I'm with most people in saying that the Triceratons kinda had their day after the Season 2 arc, but they actually tell the story very well here. The Prime Leader suspects that Honeycutt is on Earth, mistakenly, and invades Earth looking for him. At the same time, Dawn is captured by the Prime Leader and his brain is scanned for information, as the rest of the gang try to stop New York from being wiped off the face of the Earth. Along the way, we get a cool small scene where Dawn has 
this mind meld with Master Splinter that helps him beat the Triceraton technology. Oh, Donatello, my son, I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. It's never explained, but it's one of the coolest things in the show by far. What can I say, I'm just a sucker for this sweet old version of Master Splinter. After they succeed in saving the Earth, getting Dawn back, and getting the Triceratons to leave, the freaking Fugitoid comes back to Earth and lures the entire Triceraton fleet back to Earth for another confrontation and world domination! But it actually turns out to be worth it as Honeycutt fries both the Triceraton and Federation fleet ships, imprisons both their dictators, and ends the entire galactic war between the two species once and for all. Small little insert here, but I just love how this show didn't give a single crap when it came to aspect ratios. In this season especially, they don't hold back with side panels, black bars on the top and bottom, little character reactions, zoom-ins and cutaways, and it just makes it look like a damn comic book. I love it! Another reason this arc is absolutely priceless is that it introduces us to my favorite character of all time in this show, Agent Bishop. They honestly did him so dirty in 2012, but here he's an absolute badass, and we see that right away. One of the best fight scenes in this show is his dissection of the turtles, where he has them on the ropes, and even after Splinter saves them, this fight scene between Bishop who's armed with a baseball bat versus an entire team of skilled ninjas immediately shows that Bishop is a master at what he does and he will be replacing Shredder after season 3. He literally would have sliced all four turtles without breaking a sweat and the way he just looks and speaks is so cool. Kudos to the voice actor David Z. Mansley, he did an incredible job. Bishop's the ultimate anti-hero and his main objective is the protection of Earth, no matter the price. I'll definitely be talking more about Bishop later on, but generally he's my main man in this show, even more than Stockman. And that's saying a lot! After the team defeat the Federation, the Triceratons, and get out of Bishop's control, we move on from that arc and get into filler episodes. Lots of filler episodes. Granted, calling them filler episodes is a bit too harsh considering these are some of the best episodes of the entire show. The first one, Touch and Go, is my all-time favorite standalone episode. It follows Mikey and Splinter fighting off a duo named Mr. Touch and Mr. Go, who basically fist bump to get power and beat the crap out of these two. Along the way, Mikey learns to use his mind more and comes up with clever strategies to fight them off. Meanwhile, Raph meets a blind lady who's struggling financially, and he ends up giving Touch and Go stolen money to her to help her pay her mortgage. It's just an adorable little episode and showed how much range this show could have. One episode they're getting blown off the face of the earth, the next you see Raphael of all turtles sipping tea next to an old lady. Anyway, moving on to some of the other filler episodes, we have Nobody's Fool, which is a parody of Batman with its own TMNT twist. If only they knew. Ninja. Turtles only they knew. There's the cute Christmas episodes surrounding Michelangelo, and other than that, the filler episodes aren't really anything super special, until we get to Han on the run. I swear, anything with Bishop I love. We follow Han as he tries to save Karai, who is basically held hostage by Bishop on a subway car, since he wants Shredder's alien technology, and so we follow Han trying to save Karai so he can redeem his poor butt with Shredder, and the turtles unknowingly follow along until they team up with Han against Bishop, who is the bigger threat here, and we get an incredible fight scene on the train, that I can only say is choreographed beautifully. Bishop yet again fights flawlessly against the turtles, Karai, and Han all at the same time, with just his tie and glasses, and still manages to make a menacing escape with the turtles' genetic samples. Chef's kiss, honestly. More on Bishop, another episode we dive more into his bigger plan, as he abducts Splinter and reveals his army of super soldiers, who he plans to mainstream into the population. He also believes in getting rid of half the population. Inevitable, I'll say. In the end, he believes himself to be God, to be doing the dirty duties that no one wants to do, but will ultimately help mankind and survive extraterrestrial threats. In the end, he gets blown up and... Yeah, that happened. Oh, but don't worry, he's not dead yet. After this is where it really gets interesting. We get into the ultimate Draco saga, where each turtle is transported to another world, and we focus on that turtle for the episode. First with Mikey, as he goes to the superhero world and has to fight an alternate Master Splinter. Then Raph, who befriends a racer and goes on a race. Then Donnie, who gets transported to an apocalyptic nightmare world where Shredder is the supreme leader. More on this later. Then Leonardo, who goes to a world full of animals and does something, yada yada yada. Let's be honest, the only one you guys care about is Seamus and never was which I have reviewed before. It is undoubtedly one of the darkest episodes of the entire show. Leo! Leo! I actually think same as it never was is foreshadowing to the world that would have been the Earth's fate if the turtles didn't sacrifice themselves and kill the Shredder in... I don't know why I added title card for that episode, it just felt appropriate. But this is 
finally the resolution episode we needed. This season saw the true return of the Shredder, after a streak of losses in Season 2. Instead of fighting the Turtles directly, he backed off a little bit in Season 3 and sort of became a rich wealthy type who used his Oroku Saki alias to fool the mayor to stealing all the salvaged Triceraton alien technology for himself. I mean, lose the hair and this guy could be fighting Superman. After all is said and done though, his true objective is the destruction of the Utroms. So after hitching a ride on Shirel or Shredder, I'll just call him Shredder's ship, the gang gets their butts whooped by Shredder and Karai. Splinter gets electrocuted when he saves Mikey, Leo gets stabbed in the stomach by Karai after honorably saving her as she fell, Raph gets the crap knocked out of him by Shredder, and the same with Mikey and Dawn. By the end, the team decided to overload the ship's power core and self-destruct it, not only destroying themselves, the Shredder, and ending all future conflict, but saving the lives of millions of Utroms who Shirelle was going to invade and annihilate. And so they do it. The scene of Master Splinter saying, My sons, I am sorry always makes me emotional, and this scene is just top tier TMNT in my opinion. Thankfully, the stupid Utroms who caused all this mess come and save them, send the Turtles and Splinter to bandage them up, send Karai and Chaplin to jail, and send Shirelle to a final and concrete ending defeat on an ice planet on some corner of the universe. May your actions haunt you forever. Great line. Wait, does this mean Shredder's finally done? season 4. My favorite season. The lesson season as I call it. The reflection season. Everything after Exodus is now coming back to haunt us for another 26 episodes, or at least a large portion of it, and I'm totally down with this kind of awesome storytelling. We start the season in Casey's old farmhouse from season 1, as all the turtles try to heal their wounds from the explosion and try to reconcile with their sort of victory against the Shredder. And while there are characters coming and going around us, the first half of this season is really Leo's arc. I honestly think it was handled beautifully, especially because of Leo's constant sense of responsibility and the immense pressure on him trying to lead his brothers. Like, in the 2012 series, Leo constantly complains about being the leader and all that, but in this show, they expect the viewers to be smart enough to realize that that's all been brewing in Leonardo for a long time. We saw in Season 2 his intense feeling of responsibility after the city fell into a state of war, and even more simply, since the very beginning of the show, when it was always shown that Leo was the most responsible and honorable turtle, and the most skilled in combat. Here, he's in a depression state. After seeing his brothers get mutilated by Shredder, and seeing his master be electrocuted alive, Many of those things his fault to some extent, like how he saved Karai from falling when he could have spent that time saving his brothers, you can see how that can drive him to pure rage. He starts off just bitter and silent, then turning into a more depressive and melancholy sadness, and then transforming into full on rage. This was a bit exaggerated, especially with his extra raspy and angry voice acting, but I guess it was intentional to bring attention to the fact that he's constantly haunted by those memories on Shirelle's ship. For example, in Bad Day, he speaks up to Master Splinter. Do what I have to to protect this family. <gasps> As do I. Or when he strikes at Splinter later on. When are you going to teach me something I don't already know? My favorite thing is when Raph tells Leo to quit being a hothead. It's like these two characters were born to have that kind of dynamic at parts. And even better is when Raph actually agrees with Leo's tantrums and angry lectures. We're always one step behind. We act like a bunch of amateurs. How many times were you gonna get beaten before you guys wise up and realize this isn't a game? I hate to admit it, but he ain't wrong. All this anger and depression manifests themselves and result in Splinter sending Leonardo to Japan to study with the Ancient One, the Sensei of Hamato Yoshi, an old friend of Splinter and one of the best characters in TMNT. Along the journey, Leo learns many lessons. A warrior who attacks in anger is a warrior who never wins. Until it meets the Ancient One. A warrior who never fails, never learns. At first, they play the shtick of Leo not knowing it's him when he meets the Ancient One, until he finally has a rude awakening and then he realizes that he's the one who's been holding himself back. I did the best I could! I did the best I could! There wasn't any more I could have done! <laughs> If there was nothing more you could have done, 
Why do you punish yourself so? You know, kind of like a season 6 episode that we'll get to a little bit later. After he trains alongside the Ancient One and learns to control himself and fight better, Leo returns home to realize the entire lair has been trashed and his family is long gone. After Karai, who has now assumed the mantle of the Shredder for herself, destroyed the lair and made all the turtles and splinters escape in their vehicles, Leo has to track them down one by one using his new training and sense of where they are, despite Karai having him believe that his family is dead. Michelangelo tried to burrow his way to safety. But he could not dig deep enough to escape my wrath. And Raphael was blown to smithereens in the turtle's own battle shell. Anyone else find Karai's dialogue from the start a little oddly specific? And so, he finds each one of his brothers. My favorite one was Mikey, by the way. Just the pop culture references they got away with in this show were hilarious. Oh, I had the strangest dream. You were there, and the Tin Man, and the Cowardly Lion and the grouchy rap of the West. Unlike today's media, their pop culture references didn't feel forced and actually came out funny in the end. This is why Prodigal Son is one of my favorite episodes, and it marks the end of Karai's arc with Leo. The gang find a new lair, which will be their lair for the remainder of the show, and Leo finally faces Karai once and for all in one of the greatest scenes thus far. As he cuts the head off the Orokusaki statue, leaving one last souvenir for Karai to finally see the error of her ways. In a way, she's just like Leo, which is why they always had a thing for each other. She too couldn't let go of her defeat in Exodus. She too had pent up rage building inside of her. The difference being, she never had the ancient one to show her what's right. Which is why this line just makes so much sense. Your own anger defeats you, Karai. You remind me of a turtle I used to know. Wait, now that Karai is finally out of the picture, what villains does that leave us with? Bishop. Yes! I mean, season 4 is really Bishop's season to be honest. Even among the Leo arc, we still had episodes like Dragon's Brew, where we see a truly messed up and horrifying story about an innocent man who was mutated by Bishop, and is then followed around after Hun and the Purple Dragon set him free. Sir, T9581 is headed towards a housing complex near the Brooklyn Naval Yard. He still remembers. Fascinating. His horrifying melancholy response to the monster remembering where his wife lives and where he got married just speaks volumes to how evil Bishop is here. That one word is how you show and not tell, ladies and gentlemen. While I believe when worlds collide and hunt on the run had the coolest Bishop moments, there are still moments in season 4 that are primetime Bishop. I mean, there was an entire episode about Bishop kidnapping the President of the United States just so we can save him to get more government funding. Money. This was all about money. Bishop's little fiasco with the aliens abducting the president resulted in an outbreak of goo that transforms sewer life into disgusting mutant creatures, with the team have to tranquilize, but which results in Donnie getting bit by one of the creatures and mutating into a giant rampaging mutant. Well, giant rampaging super mutant, who the turtles have no choice but to turn over to Bishop, asking for his help to cure their brother. He agrees if they retrieve an artifact from Karai's headquarters, and this is after the whole Karai debacle, so needless to say, Leo's not super thrilled about it. But they still successfully get the artifact for Bishop, who ends up getting double crossed by the foot mystics who freed themselves of the artifact, and Bishop unknowingly turns Donnie back to normal with Leatherhead and Stockman's help. Speaking of Stockman, this was also a remarkably great season for Stockman. I mean, the fact that Shredder literally cut off Stockman's limbs every other episode throughout the show, leading him to have like a dozen different designs throughout the series, is messed up beyond comprehension on its own. But now this? I've reviewed Insane in the Membrane before, but it is truly a great example of how dark the writers were willing to get, and especially because they were on friggin' four kids. It's like that extra level of censorship made them even more civilly disobedient and resulted in even more messed up crap. Like, we can't say the word die, but we can see Stockman's veins pop out and wiggle around, we see a massive zit on his forehead, we see his fingers slide off and create a massive ball of pus, we see him hammer a nail into his arm, we see him grab his loose jaw and smush it back into place, as he's probably in excruciating pain, not only physically, but mentally, as we see how his life choices let him down an evil and corrupt path with the Shredder, and we see dark flashbacks to when his mother died. It's all dark as hell! And you know what? I'm totally on board! Show this to 10 year olds now. Seriously. You know, a wise and delicious looking YouTuber once said that if it weren't for these super dark plot lines in these sort of episodes, then season 6 and 7 would have never been toned down to such a childish extent that the crew, and even the fans to some extent, take their poison when they requested super dark in one season and got super pampered in another season. Perhaps if Insane in the Membrane was toned down or didn't exist, then fast forward wouldn't have completely shifted the tone. But you know what? I don't care. I'd rather have one really good and one really bad than to average out with two mediocre. Although, why am I rebutting the arguments of Jay's review? It's not like he's gonna be in this video or anything. Ah, season 5. The shortest season, the lost season, the season that by many measures also acts as the bridge between the good of the show and where it begins to delve into mediocrity. 
Season 5 actually starts with the previous episode from Season 4, where the Turtles get knocked unconscious and wake up in the lap of the gods, the home of the Ninja Tribunal. Expanding on the Foot Mystics plot from the previous season, after they were freed unknowingly from Karai's grasp by Agent Bishop, we meet four new warriors who join the Turtles to become the eight acolytes of the Ninja Tribunal and train among the fiercest ninjas in the world to stop the resurrection of the true Shredder demon who the Mystics are attempting to bring back. Before we get to that, let me start with the acolytes themselves. We meet Joy, Adam, Tora, and Faraji. Each one kind of clings on with the turtle that they connect with, but none of them get any funny lines, any memorable moments, or any semblance of character growth or development. I have no clue why they included them here, other than perhaps the fact that the turtles need people to bounce off of, but it just didn't work as well as the numerous other fleshed out side characters the show has seen. The villain they're fighting is a different Shredder. This is the original Oroku Saki, who was the strongest among the Ninja Tribunal. After defeating the Shredder Tengu, he let the demon inside him and became ultra-powerful. After the Tribunal had taken him down and put him in a casket, his reputation as a murderous monster was attractive to Chirel, who had lived on Earth at the time, so he decided to say he was that person. Seeing Tengu, Shredder, and all the carnage he can bring and finding out who Chirel got inspiration from is kind of funny and made for some pretty good action. Let it be known there was another dark episode from this season that was totally unrelated to the overall plotline, where it was revealed that Hun and the Garbage Man were actually conjoined twins who were surgically separated in a back alley, leaving the Garbage Man to squirm in the trash for the rest of his life. Since the Garbage Man was a lesser known villain on the show, this would have brought more clarity and backstory to his character. But in the end, it was immediately dismissed by the networks never saw the light of day, but perhaps in another world, the same execs who greenlit and insane in the membrane for production could have let this slip, and we could have possibly gotten yet another memorable dark episode out of the show. Kind of a shame. There were also other filler episodes like Fathers and Sons, which made one of the cutest and more wholesome episodes to come out of the show, and served as a nice breath in between the crazy two halves of the season, ignoring the show-altering plot holes, but that's neither here nor there. Then we get into the two-part finale to this season, this whole series even. I mean, they clearly meant for that to happen, right? Every turtle, Splinter, Bishop, Hun, Stockman, Karai, Chaplin, the Purple Dragons, the Justice Force, the other acolytes, even the ghost of Hamato Yoshi comes back. Now isn't that based? And after that, they have their final confrontation with the Shredder. We cut to this beautiful shot of New York as the show ends, not on its highest note, but certainly a heartwarming place to end on. Every character is here, we did the whole thing, time to end this and move on to bigger and better things, right? Well, we're here, ladies and jellyfish. The season you've all been waiting for. It's not like this season is the holy grail of terrible, but it's certainly mediocre. And compared to the first five, absolutely a massive drop in quality from a consistent nine to an embarrassing four. For some reason, right after the massively exciting cliffhanger at the end of season four when the turtles got sent to the tribunal, Forkes and Fox decided to release this season before season five, completely messing up the continuity because of, you guessed it, toy sales. They saw the success of other cartoons taking off around this time, and Forkes needed to have have their own gimmick show with which they could sell their toys. Sonic X, Pokemon, or any of the Yu-Gi-Oh's weren't really made for that to the level the Turtles were, with all the battle shells and stuff like that, and most of them were ending around this time anyway. They assumed that they'd be better off making it with a more childish tone, with bright flashy colors and the characters that will demand toy sales. But they were wrong. Maybe they sold a few more toys, but the fans got instantly turned off. They created mass confusion because we leave on a cliffhanger just to come back to the Turtles 100 years in the future talking to some giant robot, and it caused a massive shift in quality. While Season 4 ended in April 2006, it would be almost two years later in 2008 when season 5 finally saw the light of day. This isn't really a problem for us now, watching it nice and chronologically on YouTube, but the reason it's important is because there were references to season 5 within Fast Forward before fans even got introduced to some of these characters or plot elements. Anyway, the season itself also has its problems. Let's start with how it looks. The Turtles' designs look really basic. In the first few seasons, there were inconsistencies here and there, but their heads generally had a round shape with very muscular elements and different parts that would stick out. Here, it's very basic and geometric, basically two lines in a semicircle. This was clearly done as a way to animate it more cheap, and it doesn't look more creative or inspired at all. Their lighting is bland and their masks are just one flat color. Splinter looks atrocious. I can't really put my finger on it, but if I had to guess, it would be that his eyebrows are white now, he has brown pupils, and he smiles a lot more weirdly, and at all. His character also had a massive downgrade, becoming less wise and basically being just resorted to comic relief alongside Serling. The world itself is also a bit uninspired, which may be a bit of a hot take, but I'm sticking with it. It 
just looks so cliche future city, and barely looks different from the old New York aside from flying cars and a more futuristic look. It looks like they just asked the kid what the future looks like and went with that. Like for example, when they go to Dehunip in season 2, the world looks bizarre and crazy, there's tons of creative elements, and it doesn't look like something generic or cliche. This just looks like a bright saturated mess. Speaking of saturated, I hate this color scheme. It's like they took Raph's character model and just raised the saturation and contrast and left it at that. The original seasons, while a lot more toned down, had great color dynamics and used the shadows to emphasize their masks and skin tones. Here just looks like Coco Melon Tortoise and the Hare story time. As far as the characters go, everyone is overly flanderized. Leo is a lifeless shell of a leader. Raph is just loud and obnoxious, but not in a charming way at all. Mikey is just a two-year-old with no development, aside from one episode, and we'll get to that. And there's not much I can say about Donnie. Every character has a bit of an ego, and Splinter is just not a wise sensei at all here. Every character constantly states the obvious and says it's ninja time because we have to copy Ben 10 as much as possible or the kiddies might sit on the remote and switch to Cartoon Network. Cody's entire concept just pisses me off. I hate his design, I hate his voice, I hate how quickly the turtles become best bros with him. I like how he's Casey Naples' great grandson, and his uncle Darius Dunn is probably the best villain in the season, but largely I find Cody to be one of the most intolerable characters in this season. Speaking of villains, they are all largely terrible. I don't like Viral, I don't like Shokunabo, Triple Threat's not bad, and most of the minor ones are pretty bland and uncreative, or just begging to be action figures. Where the season shines is when it says what happened to all the old characters from previous seasons. For example, Bishop's story is incredibly well done here, as well as Stockman. After a fatal accident, Bishop was trapped under a heavy object, and rather than take vengeance on him or leave him, an alien that he imprisoned and experimented on, that he never knew, saved his life, just out of kindness. That day, he changed his entire view of alien threats, and that caused him to form a peace alliance with alien species, rather than try to fight them, which he saw as the solution to Earth's prolonged defense. This made him president of the Pangalactic Alliance, rather than the Earth Protection Force. Stockman was abandoned by Bishop after he was trapped in the accident explosion, but at the end of Head of State, the pathetic brain with tentacles finally gets a 100% happy ending, as Bishop offers him a free human body transplant and an honest job working for the government. Say, is there a vice president? It's heartwarming moments like this that make fast forward excel at times. Or the episode Graduation Day, Class of 2105, where Monkey focuses on himself and comes to an epiphany that he's been the one holding himself back, not any of the video games he wastes his time playing. It's an overused copy of Touch and Go in the Ancient One, but it's a good episode nonetheless. Another decent one is Timing is Everything, where we get a huge time travel plot, where Donnie and Splinter see the moment they were mutated with the TCRI ooze, and Leo and Cody time travel to the water tower fight with Shredder, causing Donnie to send himself a letter 100 years in the future. Special Special delivery! <laughs> Very special! It would appear so. Slow day at the office. This envelope has been sitting in the back for over a hundred years. We'd love to know what's inside and maybe even meet Mr. Splitterson. <laughs> Honestly, screw Serling for this scene and this scene alone. He's like the worst scene in the entire show. Anyway, while this episode is pretty cool to watch, it's a bit of a mystery how Leo fighting Shredder again after the water tower debacle and bringing him and a bunch of foot soldiers to the future and fighting them didn't mess up the whole time continuum or whatever, since this would kind of change Shredder's path. As you can tell, the season didn't have any two partners or big arcs. It's very episodic. And that's a large reason why it felt so slow and painful to watch. It's just not engaging when there's no stakes to anything, and all our characters feel like they know everything. Like, do we even care about fighting the Shredder anymore, after Shredder himself admits that Leo is more powerful? No, probably not. And another thing, the theme song sucks! <laughs> final season of this show may actually tie in my book as equally bad as Fast Forward. It too has some heartwarming moments and good aspects, but just like Fast Forward, it feels empty. For starters, I love this theme song. It's nowhere near as good as the first one, but credit where credit's due, I know they had a cold contest on their website for fans to vote on, so kudos to them for having that whole thing in the first place. Imagine having to listen to this before every episode. <laughs> Now, what I don't like. Every design is atrocious. The pupils are terrible. Whoever thought the pupils were a good idea, throw them on the icy planet with Sherelle. Casey, and especially April, look horrendous. Why is she a blonde? The whole thing with the show is that she's supposed to be a redhead now. As for the plot, the Splinter arc was incredibly drawn out. Every episode is about Donnie's guilt for having his master zapped away in front of him, but we all know it wasn't really his fault, so what difference does it make? Like for Leo in season 4, at least you know he actually has severe depression because he could have done a lot of things differently to save his family. Or when Raph breaks out, it's just because 
because he's a hothead. But Donnie being guilty is just boring to watch. He's easily this show's least fleshed out turtle, and this was definitely the wrong way to go out an arc with him in my opinion. The Splinter thing was stretched out among several episodes, and I guess it was this season's big mission, and it wasn't super slow, but again, we could be watching better things than turtles getting cyber bits every episode by fighting some villain. And of course, Shredder has to come back for the hundredth time, and blah 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 blah. Alright, I know I sound like season 6 Johnny Test right now, but you can't really blame me for being slightly ticked off at this show, for falling so low so quickly, and for such stupid reasons. Alright, fine, I'll be positive for a second. The wedding episode is beautiful. Not only do we see every character we've seen, and I do mean every character, from the Battle Nexus dudes, the Tribunal, Justice Force, Bishop, Cody, the Rat King, Ancient One, Honeycut, and Mortu, even Karai and Chaplin all join together, all in harmony, for the marriage of the couple that's been developing for seven whole seasons. It's honestly a beautiful way to end off this show in such a fan y way, and it has a beautiful tone and direction throughout. But there's just one thing missing here, something tiny. Oh yeah, a sense of need. It's what we've always wanted to see, but not why we wanted to see it. It's awesome to see all these characters together, if only this episode was long enough and actually cared enough to flesh out these dynamics properly and with motive. How does Karai feel about all this? Can we get a look into the thoughts of Mortu and the Utrams after Shirelle comes back and almost kills them? I thought they were lifelong adversaries. How about seeing with Ancient One talking to the Tribunal? Also, how did the Tribunal feel about seeing the Shredder's likeness and possibly being reminded of the traumatic events of the true Tengu Shredder? How about the damn Acolytes who never saw Chrome Dome to begin with? I wish we got more of these moments, but alas, more time is spent fighting Shredder for the hundredth time and making me focus on those goddamn pupils that it doesn't allow for genuine enjoyment of this incredible opportunity for a two-parter extravaganza. I mean, the only parts of the episode that have that sort of thing, like Jen erasing the name of one of the tribunal guys and having an argument, are the only parts of the episodes that I feel genuinely invested in these kind of characters. Maybe I'm looking too deep into this crap, but at the end of the day, if they want to preach that they did this for the fans, at least do it with a bit more motive and genuine reasoning. So I guess the moral of for Back to the Sewers, oh sorry, I mean Back to the Sewer, singular, is that it does fine, but if fine is really your standard for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, then I think we forgot what made the first season so magical to start off with. So, what caused the downfall of the 2003 TMNT? It definitely started off incredible, and maintained that impeccable quality for the larger part of 5 seasons. Even some of the fast forward and back to the sewer stuff, I'd say, were respectable, and were stories that needed to be told, like the Bishop story or Case in April's wedding. But on the other hand, the corporate decisions, like pretty much every other show I've talked about in the series, ended up being the downfall, the latter half being watered down to appeal to younger kids, even though the first 5 did just fine in doing that, censoring semi-benign things here and not censoring pretty dark crap there and putting the ratings and toy sales as the number one priority when thinking about season 6 and 7. Look how that turned out. The show that started out and delivered for 116 episodes, faithfulness to the source material, incredible character development, a darker tone, consistently sick and smooth animation, a great balance of action and humor, one of the best theme songs in cartoon history, among so much other things, but ultimately traded for a bland, bright, saturated, child pandering mess. I was trying so hard to be hip and to appeal for more ratings, and failed on both those fronts. It wasn't terrible, but it's is that really the standard this show started on? However, I don't know about you, but I still hold the show close to my heart and think that, for the majority of its run, it was one of the most awesome cartoons on television. You could even say that it was the best TMNT show to ever come out. Hey, you could just say that TMNT 2003 was the greatest cartoon ever. <laughs> So that's the video, thanks for watching and if you enjoyed please be sure to subscribe and click the bell to support me and my channel. And while you're at it, tell me your thoughts on the 2003 TMNT series in the comments below and share the video if you really want to help me out. If you want to be up to date with everything on me and the channel, you can follow me on Twitter at MrAskAir and join our amazing Discord server to chat with our growing community of users. Huge huge thank you to Jay's Reviews for his review of Season 5 earlier, he was super kind and gracious to hop on board this video, and if you, for some reason, haven't seen his stuff, he made an 8 part retrospective on the entire show. Much more detailed than I ever could, so go give him some love and tell him that Ask Your sent ya. And if you hear from Jay's channel, uh, hi, please subscribe, I'm lonely. Anyway, the music credits and all the sources will be in the description below, and other than all that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you beautiful ladies and jellyfish next time. Shalom. Brilliant deduction, Sherlock Shelf of Brains. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles